So if you don't know me, I'm Stephanie Wright. Most of you probably do, but if you do not, I, um, I serve here. My husband is on staff. I'm in the worship ministry. I love to sing. I'd rather sing a thousand solos than to speak. So you're getting to see the power of the, of the Lord on display this morning because I am out of my element. And those of you that know me know that this is a great step of faith for me. So y'all be in prayer for me as I talk um, that I would have clarity and um, try to keep my emotions together, really. Let's, so... Um, all right, so when Rachel first asked me to speak, it took me several months to decide on a topic, and the Lord kept confirming the topic of contentment. And the funny part is, surprise, I really struggle with this topic. So it was, I told the Lord that <laughs> and said, you got the wrong guy. Um, maybe not me. I, I probably shouldn't be the one talking on this. I don't, I don't have this all together. I'm a discontentment sufferer. Can anybody identify with that? So, um, but, you know, he kept nudging me and kept nudging me. And um, so I come to you today as not someone that's got it all neatly wrapped up and going to deliver it to you so perfectly. And I've got this all covered. I am definitely speaking to myself and um, I'm desperate for Jesus to teach me how to do this well. So I'm going to just kind of let you read my diary, so to speak, on what the Lord's been teaching me, and hopefully it will encourage you too, because I have a sneaky suspicion that a lot of people deal with this. <laughs> Could I get an amen? <laughs> a lot of people deal with this, so I hope this is an encouragement to you today. The three things that we're going to hit on today, because I like, I like my notes, what is contentment and can we have it? What is contentment and can we have it? What does the Bible say about it? And why does it matter? So those are the three things we're going to cover. So let's pray and we will get started. Um, Father, we ask you to open our hearts and our ears this morning to your message. Um, may we learn and be reminded of the contentment made available to us through your son, Jesus. We ask that our lives will bear much fruit from the things said today in this place. And we ask all this in your son's name. Amen. Okay, so did you ever hear about the wealthy businessman who interrupted his interesting and extravagant life to spend a few days in a monastery? I hope your stay is a blessed one, said the monk who showed him to his tiny, simple cell. If you need anything, let us know, and we will teach you how to live without it. So we laughed. That's so funny. I thought that was so cute. But isn't that our greatest fear, our deepest fear, to go without? Um, to go without what we want and to go without what we think we need. Um, I know it's mine. And our culture has made a whole acronym for this, okay? Young people, I can say that now because I just turned 40. So I can say young people, tell our older generation what... FOMO is, F-O-M-O, -O. what does that stand for? Fear of missing out. That is actually a thing. Fear of missing out. So we've even titled it, you know? Um, <laughs> so let's talk about discontentment first for a minute. And we, know all, we all know how easily this comes. In a moment, in a moment, we can be discontent. Um, commercial, social media, sparks feelings. Comparison, jealousy, entitlement, sadness, all fertile, gra fertile ground for discontentment. Okay, the process of waiting, fertile ground to be discontent if you're not careful. Unanswered prayers or prayers answered no, fertile ground for discontentment. If your health is suffering, your relationships are suffering, your pocketbook suffering, maybe you don't like your life, your weight, your house, your home, you just don't. Um, think that you think parenting's difficult or you don't have the money in your bank account that you want. Or everybody's life looks good on Facebook and Instagram. They're happy. It's fun. They're, they're, it's so easy for them. But that's a lie, and we buy into that lie. And, um, and we could go on forever about things that can make us discontent, can't we? Um, so what is contentment? The dictionary defines it as satisfied, pleased, untroubled, at ease, fulfilled, glad, tranquil. Doesn't that sound good? Have, um, when's the last time that you felt like that? 
Or have you ever felt like that? I mean, let's just be honest. Have you ever felt those things on an ongoing basis? Um, And I think we all have those moments where we think it just can't get any better than this. You know, this is just so good. These moments that everything's right in the world, but that's not contentment. What is that? That is happiness related to our circumstances, right? So our flesh tells us that when our circumstances are happy, we're what? Happy, yay. When our circumstances are miserable, we're miserable. And that's no way for a believer to live, but we fall into that, and we, we, we don't want to live that way, if we're honest. I don't think anybody wants to live that way, but we so often do, and we let ourselves. So can we have it? Can we have contentment? And can we live a life of perpetual contentment in Christ, where regardless of what your circumstances are right now, can you be content if nothing ever changes, or if it everything changes. And I've got really good news. The Apostle Paul tells us a resounding yes, you can. And this is where we're going to spend most of our time learning from Paul. So what does the Bible say about it? And I've got a slide for that. Let's read Philippians 4, 10 through 13 together. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So a little bit of context first here. Paul is writing, and he is currently imprisoned in Rome as he's writing this. And some commentaries even tell us that the prison he was in, it's quite possible that sewage was running through the the prison. So he could have been amidst sitting, standing, whatever, as he penned this, sewage. So put that into your brain for a second. And um, also earlier in this passage that we didn't read in verse 4, he says, rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice. That's where this, that verse that you're so familiar with, you probably sang it in Sunday school when you are a little bitty, that song. That's from this passage, this difficult passage talking about having the strength to get through these difficult circumstances. So that's just a little back context for, for this passage. So number one, in verse 11, he says, I have learned in whatever situation I am co- to be content. Contentment is learned, okay? Contentment is not our natural response. Does that surprise you? Um, I think as a preschool teacher, you can be in a classroom for two seconds and realize that that is the truth about human nature. Little Johnny loves his toy so so very much, but as soon as he sees Susie's toy, he's just got to have it, and he's not happy anymore, right? So I think we have a little bit, a little bit of that in us um, as grown-ups, but we have to battle the normal response of our flesh. And if it is learned, we need to be taught, don't we? So who's our teacher? The Holy Spirit, right? He promises to teach us this. He's sanctifying us. He's making us like Christ. So he will be your teacher. And we need to learn this. How do you teach your students something? If you have any teachers in here, you have to practice and be tested, right? So I'm sure you... um, I'm sure you recognize in some of the lives of your spiritual mentors, godly ladies that have walked with Jesus longer than you, you can see they've had practice. I mean, you can go to them and see that they can sometimes be a lot more contented than you are in your stage of life. And that's, that is practice in walking with Jesus. Um, so a, an example in the text of this, practicing and learning, would be going back to the Israelites, okay? God's chosen people wandering in the desert, Let's look at Deuteronomy 8. I have a slide. Um, It tells tells us here, He, the Lord, humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know or teach you that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. 
So they needed the most basic thing here. What did they need? What did they want? Food. They were hungry, right? But the Lord said, I made you hunger to teach you that you don't really need food. You need me. Every word that comes out of my mouth is food for you. And, but just because I love you and I'm your father and I meet your physical needs too, I'm going to give you manna. But wasn't that also an opportunity to be content? Can you imagine eating the same meal for 40 years? Right? So um, the Lord set them up with an opportunity to learn humility and contentment in this. They had a lot to learn in the desert. My Bible study is going through Exodus right now. and They've got a lot to learn, but contentment was certainly one of them. So we need to learn this. It's not natural, and that's okay that you have to learn it. And God's going to give you opportunities to learn it, and he's going to be your teacher. So we've got the best teacher to be able to teach us in this, okay? Number two, contentment is not tied to circumstances. You probably saw this one coming. So back to the passage, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Verse 12, I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. So contentment is not tied to circumstances. But let's have an honest moment. I think that this, especially for me, upsets us to hear that. It upsets us because I think we deep down feel like if you would just do this one thing, I promise I would be content. I promise I wouldn't ask for anything else. If you would just do this one thing or if you would just take away this one thing, it would be okay. But, but, Anything we hold higher than Christ to make us content. What is that? What do we call that? It's an idol, right? Contentment is not tied to circumstances, which is why Paul can sit imprisoned, surrounded by sewage, not knowing what's going to happen to him, and say, rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice. It's not tied to that. It's not tied to circumstances. Um, Let's just remind ourselves of some of the circumstances that this guy, Paul, had to walk through, lest we forget. Okay, so 2 Corinthians 11, 25 through 28, he writes, Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there is a daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. So ladies, Those are difficult circumstances. If anybody can speak on this, it's him. And he's the man saying, any and every circumstance, I can be content. Any and every circumstance, that is powerful. Look at Habakkuk 3.17. This says, though the fig trees should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vine, the produce of the olives fail, and the field yields no fruit, Uh, The flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herds in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. Do you hear that? I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. So this sounds like very bad things are going on circumstantially for this farmer. (laughs) Sounds like crops aren't producing. Flocks are sick or dying off. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. There it is again. Did you notice it? Um, who else just, just said this? Paul, right? He said the same words. And they're both speaking of difficult circumstances, and they're both urging us to rejoice in the Lord. So we need to recognize the tie, the tie-in right there. Um, why? Why rejoice in the Lord when things are bad? What does that do? Why? 
Because the Lord is my strength, Paul says. In verse 13, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. And I think we get a little flip-flopped on this verse because I think it's so familiar, it's used so much that we think, I can do anything I want and be successful. God will give me strength to be successful in anything I want to do. But I don't believe that that's really what Paul's saying here. I think he is saying, I mean, for instance, if we make that our, our sports first for the football team, you know, I'm going to win this game through Christ who strengthens me. Well, what if it's the Lord's will for you to lose every football game? You know, then you're going to get confused. You're going to get confused and think, well, that, did, that doesn't really work. Well, Paul is saying you will be strengthened in anything that's brought to you through your, your, circumstantial, your circumstances, anything that the Lord brings to you and you wake up. We don't get to choose what we wake up to, right? We don't know what a day holds. But God says, I will give you the strength to do that. I will give you the strength to walk through that. And you can face plenty, need, abundance, and you can do it through the strength of Christ. That's what, that's what it's talking about. Isn't it funny that he says, he reminds us that when you face plenty, you can be content. Isn't that funny? You'd think we would know that, yet we still can be discontent when we have plenty. So number three. Contentment depends on a work of the Holy Spirit. Paul tells us in Christ, he is the one that provides the strength. It's the work of the Holy Spirit in us. We do not have enough get up and go to be content in and of ourselves. We just cannot do it. So essentially, the Holy Spirit is going to teach us uh, what he can only accomplish in his power. He's going to teach us how to do something that he's going to have to come in and help us do it. So it's all hinging on him. It's all hinging on Christ. Um, I have a little illustration. Um, I used to have a little verse card in my wallet when I was a college student. And it was the first part of the, the 23rd Psalm. It says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Okay? So I, I've been a Christian a while, but you know, Sometimes you just read verses and you just take them a certain way that you've read them that first time and you hold on to that. So I kind of used that. It kind of drove me to deprive myself for Christ. <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And I would say, Stephanie, you shouldn't want for anything or ask for anything. It's, that's not godly. Um, you be happy with what you got. You don't, ask, you don't ask for anything, you know. And that you shall not want with so much pressure. Because if I felt myself needy or wanting, wanting to go to the Lord and change something that I was going through, I felt like that was not godly. And I needed to stop it, slap my hand on the wrist kind of a thing. It wasn't until years later walking with Jesus that I realized I was way misinterpreting that verse, way off. Because I actually read it in another translation. And it said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. Or another translation, I lack nothing. That was a life-changing, eye-opening thing for me. It shifted everything on the other end because I had not made any of it about God's grace. It was all about, it was all about me and my willpower, and um, it blew my mind. It, it, he was telling me he wasn't telling me I couldn't ask for or desire things. He was just telling me that everything I truly need, I will have. I lack nothing. Have you ever heard somebody say, well, she doesn't lack for nothing? Well, what does that mean? It means they're, they've got abundance. They don't even need anything. That's you and me. We lack nothing. Spiritually, we've got everything. We've got everything we need. And not the needs that we may think we want when we look on Facebook, but it's the needs determined by our Heavenly Father. We'll have, we'll have exactly what we need, exactly what we need. Um, and he doesn't ever stop at just the minimum requirement, does he? He's abounding in love. We just talked about this in my D-Life group. He's abounding in love. So if you look later in the 23rd Psalm, they say, my cup overflows. So he gives you what you need, but your needs are just spilling out of that cup. They're overflowing. Um, in Christ, your cup is overflowing. 
It has nothing to do with your circumstances and everything to do with your Savior, right? You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. So sometimes I have to remind myself, who is this that strengthens me? Who is he? And this is one of my favorite passages of the Bible. It is all highlighted and underlined so much that it's going to bleed through the other side. It's just, you know, barely hanging on in there because I just love it. And um, it's Colossians 1, 15 through 20. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in, that, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making, making peace by the blood of his cross. That is he who strengthens you. Wow. He's everything. He's everything. And he's the one giving you the strength. If he's giving you the strength, you can do it. You can do it. So why does this matter? So that's all great and wonderful, but why does it matter? Because sorrow and pain are real. Being content does not mean we deny real pain or difficulty. Absolutely not. It's not pretending everything's okay. It's not ignoring, ignoring disappointment or real grief because suffering is in our lives and it's real and God cares about that. But what it should do is tell you you don't have to live in the pain because we have access to contentment through him, through Christ. Um, even in the middle of the heartache and the pain. Jesus himself prayed in the garden before he was crucified, Lord, if there's, you know, let this cup pass from me if it, you know, if it's possible. Meaning, if there's another way, you know, this can be hard. But your will be done. So it's okay to pray for things to change. Things are hard. Things are hard, but the Lord knows And he is going to walk you through it if he has that for you. He's going to walk you through it every step of the way. His will will be done in your life. And he knows knows what we need. And he knows even when difficult circumstances happen, he's there. He's He's not ever leaving. Why does this matter? Because you're going to have difficulty, whether or not you know him. Whether or not you know Christ, you're going to have difficulty. Um, But guess what? We have hope if we know Jesus, right? If everything goes away, if everything in our life crumbles and we are just left there standing, he is there and we still have everything in him. We have everything in him. Another reason this matters is because we need to be alert to the fact that the enemy wants to keep us discontent. He would love for you to stay right there because we're not very effective when we're just living in a spirit of discontentment. Um, And this is his tactic from the beginning. He uses this. How did he entice Eve to sin? Look at what you're not getting. Look what he's keeping from you. Right? And discontentment leads to covetousness. What is covetousness? Wrongly desiring what's not ours. Wanting what belongs to somebody else. How did Satan become Satan? Who did he want to be? He wanted to be like God. He would desire something that didn't belong to him. Um, This is what can root up. Covetousness can root up from a heart that stays discontent. So be alert and on guard that the enemy would love to keep you there and that we can keep ourselves there if we're not not careful. When we're self-focused, we're not Jesus-focused. When we're self-focused, we're not effective and we begin to think and believe things about God that are not true. So that is just our, our warning together to, to know that we believe things about God that aren't true when we stay there, when we stay discontent. So if you have a saving relationship with Jesus, 
there is so much hope and this can be a reality in your life to have contentment in Christ. Um, we have access to all the strength that we need to be able to do it by his power, of course. If you do not know Jesus, you don't have that hope. You don't have that hope of being content. It's not going to happen without him. You have to know him, and he wants, you to, he wants to know you. He wants a relationship with you. And this very day, this very day, you can begin that road to contentment through the power of Jesus in your life um, and having a saving relationship with him. So let's remember that we're going to mess up. It's hard. It's hard to do this. But we're learning, and we're going to walk together. We're, we're learning together. We're going we're gonna to have chances to be tested. We're going to have practice at this, and that's good. And we're learning. But the Holy Spirit is going to give us the power to be able to do it. And our circumstances are going to constantly change. That's one thing that is always a sure thing is that everything's going to change. Circumstances are going to change. So he will give you peace. He will give you peace. Um, and your contentment is not tied to your circumstances. So whatever you got going on right this very minute, you can be content. You can be content. So I thought that since Paul urges us to rejoice in the Lord, um, that we would just end with a song that means so much to me. Um, it's called Jaira. I'm sure it's very popular, and I'm sure that y'all have heard this song. But it means Jaira is the name meaning Jehovah Jireh, which is a name of God that means God will provide. So I think it's very fitting that we're going to do what Paul calls us to do, and we're going to rejoice. And I just want you to listen to the words. This is going to kind of be our invitation time. I just want you to listen to the words. I want you to worship. And whatever you have in your heart right now, that I know you thought of that one thing. You thought of that one thing today, that if he, he would either do this or take this away. We all have them. So just give it to him. Just give it to him today and just worship together. And we're just going to watch this for a few minutes and, um, and then we'll close.